Welcome to the Being Human is Good for Business podcast. In each episode, the leadership development experts at Trilogy Effect explore how the process of self-discovery unleashes potential in us all. Now here's your host, Sherilyn Starkey. Welcome to the Being Human is Good for Business podcast starring the leadership development experts at Trilogy Effect. I'm your host, Sherilyn Starkey. The team at Trilogy Effect works to surface the untapped potential in people and organizations. And their work is grounded in something called the Enneagram, which is a transformational development framework, which provides a lens through which all of us can see or become aware of our own automatic patterns of seeing and reacting to to people in different situations. So in our last episode, we touched upon the concept of embodiment and leadership. And I encourage you to check that out because it provides some context for what we're about to discuss. And I put a link in the show notes for that. But today, we're gonna take a deeper dive into the instinctual center or the belly center. This describes leaders who tend to rely on their guts when they're making tough decisions. So my first question goes to Heather Morass, who is Trilogy Effects Managing Partner. Heather, can you provide us with an overview of the assets and the liabilities of this instinctive center? Well, um, the first thing to know about the instinctive center types is that it's type eights, nine, and one. And all three of those types are ultimately in search of autonomy. They have three different ways of going after it, but ultimately that's what they're trying to achieve through their ego structures. And they're often called the don't mess with me types. Mm -hmm. They're the little, you know, the type, the little child, the terrible twos, the little one who starts to say, no, you're not the boss of me. And I have three different strategies that I employ to make sure you know it and I know it. So the assets of these three types are that, first of all, they're in the instinctive or the gut center. So they tend to be very grounded. There's a gut intelligence that they are connected with that has them sense before they even have words or feelings around what the right action might be in a situation. So it's very instinctive. You know, it's kind of the, I should fight, I should flee, or I should play dead here. Mm -hmm. It's very um, sensate. It's quite body oriented. So those are the assets. You know, there's a sort of gut level physical intelligence that they have a strong connection with. And the liabilities, you can probably imagine, is that because they're more in their connected with uh, right action, Sometimes they can either take too much action, like type eights will be excessively taking action, almost compulsively. Type nines may withdraw and forget to take action, try and hope it'll go away. And the type ones will be kind of in this dutiful, I'm trying to contain things so that I'm taking the right action, but it's a very constricted relationship with what needs to get done here in this moment. And we'll go into all of them more in more detail, but that's kind of the short version of it. And so these personality tendencies are hardwired. You said about toddlers. So it's something that's hardwired from, from birth, from a, when your personality starts uh, its most basic formation? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you'll see with each of these cent- the intelligence centers that there's kind of a developmental phase that you'll recognize for all human beings. And in this, these types, the developmental phase is that separation. It's the boundary making. It's I'm me and you're you putting up the boundaries. Right. And it's in three different ways. And all types go through that development. All human beings have Mm -hmm. that developmental phase. So, okay. Well, let's learn more about, about the gut center. So uh, up next, it's uh, Wendy Apple, who's a Trilogy Effect partner and is the author of Inside Out Enneagram, the Game Changing Guide for Leaders. Wendy, they call Enneagram Type 8 the challenger. Do you think that's a good name for that type? Why do they call them that? Uh, yeah, it's a good name. It kind of captures the essence and also the boss is the other working name that uh, people use. 
Um, and the reason that uh, type 8 is often called the challenger is because people feel challenged by type 8. You know, they, they're, they're constantly pushing on you, challenging your thinking, challenging your actions. Um, they're trying to find out where your boundary is. So they're always searching for other people's boundaries. So they're always pushing. You feel this, their energy pushing up against you. And um, mostly eights are unaware that they're having that impact on other people. Um, when I've coached type eights, they'll say, what? You know, people, I'm just trying to get to a good answer. They just kind of very unconscious of the way that uh, they, they impact others. So some of their um, assets are this forward action, forward mov uh, movement. And the challenger also has another meaning, which is they actually like to take on big challenges. They're not afraid of big challenges. They kind of carve a path forward for other people to follow them. And when they're in their healthy, more awake, aware state, people want to get line up right behind them and follow them. They're more of what we in Western culture anyway would think of as archetypal leaders. Can you give us a couple of examples of some famous Enneagram 8s? Well, uh, yes, I can. Um, now, I, I just want to put the caveat in here that we don't know this for a fact. Um, okay. We're all, you know, Heather, Mary Beth, and I are always very, of a certain ethos around typing other people. It's really up for people to kind of go inside and, and, and discover their best fit type for themselves. All we can do is say, how people present, you know, in terms of historical people, how they, that they may present as a type eight, the boss, the challenger. So, but we, I don't want to state this as this mm. is fact. Okay. So, that's fair. All right. So from a, from a, what would appear to be a more healthy type eight, I would look to a Martin Luther King. Mm. Um, what one, of, one of the most famous most respected leaders of modern times, really. Mm, exactly. And um, what Heather didn't mention, which is important to say here, is the other thing that uh, the, the belly center, gut center, instinctive center types have in common is they wear a pair of glasses through which they see the world and make choices around their actions. And so the, the glasses or the filter is, is this fair? Is this right? Or is this just? And Martin Luther King was out there looking for justice, mm. right? doing what was just in the world and took right action and took action based on that wow. and, 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 and did carve that path for other people to follow. So he, he appears based on how he lived his life as a type eight. Type eights can show up in any kind of profession. Um, probably Dame Judi Dench, Oh. It's likely a type eight. And what I yeah. want to put forward here is the intensity. Eights have a certain kind of intensity and a groundedness. You know, she spoke clearly, slowly. There was this gravitas. She's an actress. Um, and, but you feel her intensity. So just as another, um, another type of type eight. Yeah, you also feel her don't mess with me. Could you maybe give us an example of uh, a strategy that uh, a type eight would use to help build their leadership qualities? Yes. Yeah. Because you wanted to talk about the assets and then there are the liabilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of liabilities are, I pointed to it a little bit, this challenging energy to be aware that they have a lot of force behind them. Mm. A lot, they use a lot of force that other people can, you know, their hair gets blown back. So it's, it's really kind of using the dial to dial it down a little bit. You know, there is a volume control, there is an energy control and really modulating um, for different situations. This isn't a one size fits all. Sometimes you don't need to use as much force, as much energy. You don't have to push so hard. Um, it's really kind of bringing people along with you. Don't feel like don't feel like it's all on your shoulders. Share the weight, share the burden, engage others. So lots of things we could say, but I, you know, that's what comes first to mind. It all sounds like really good advice, especially There's for some, me. <laughs> yeah, 
there's something that comes to mind here too, and that there is an underlying emotional engine that starts to rev, you know, when they lose awareness, if you like, mm-hmm. and it's anger. We have this relationship with anger, like it's a bad emotion, but it's just an emotion. Mm-hmm. And it is an emotion that helps fuel action. And with the type eight, it's often said that a lot of that excessive force is from not being aware of the anger, this kind of passion that's rising. And with the type eight, the challenge developmentally is to stop expressing our anger and to start feeling it. Mm. And that starts bringing you back in. Sounds like a tall order. (laughs) Yeah. Mary Beth has a favorite saying for, for that one. Anger. Oh, anger is Sad's bodyguard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Easier. And it's That's, I very, love that. I love that. Very yeah. accurate. Yeah. Well, let's bring Mary Beth into the conversation here. She's also a partner at Trilogy Effect, and she works with many large companies to help develop their leaders. So Mary Beth, tell us about the Peacemaker or the Enneagram Type 9. I would love to. So the peacemakers, our peacemaker friends, are the mediators of the Enneagram. Their gifts are are around being accepting and inclusive. Um, They're inherently patient, kind, um, stable leaders. They tend to be both really grounded and grounding. I know that when I'm around a type nine leader, I can feel myself exhaling and, you know, feeling my feet on the ground. And I just feel stable and secure and grounded. They're excellent at seeing all points of view and making sure that they're hearing all points of view. Um, yeah, so those are some of the, the assets and the gifts of our type nine friends. And, you know, where they can get tripped up, I'll just, I'll tag back to Heather's comments about for type eights, it really helps them to feel their anger versus expressing it. For our type nine friends, it would really be great if they could express it Mm. because they tend to suppress their anger because harmony and, you know, keeping the peace is really important to someone who's a type nine. And they'll have this feeling that if they express their anger, relationships can be harmed or ruined. Um, And what happens is by not expressing it, they get what they most fear, right? It actually turns little molehills into giant mountains, um, yeah, expressing their anger, expressing their own needs would really benefit the type nine. I will say type nines, while they are these incredibly kind, accepting, wonderful people, they're also the most stubborn people that Uh I've ever met. I mean, ever. (laughs) It's really something like you might think that if you look at the challenger, the boss and the peacemaker, that if they were in conflict in some way that the challenger would win, Mm -mm -mm -mm. The type nines will just close up like a little clam and withdraw completely instead of addressing, um, you know, the the conflict that is going on in the moment. And I should also say, I just want to say that this is not when nines are at their best, what I'm describing, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of more average behaviors. Um, So, yeah, that, that conflict avoidance can really shut down what might be productive conflict and keep things moving because to Heather's earlier point about anger fueling action what nines can do is end up shutting down that action even though they're in the belly center they can get a bit complacent and withdrawn and so these are growth opportunities for the type nine is to really express that anger express what's true for them have the you know the conversation around whatever the conflict is and move forward can you give us uh, examples of somebody famous that presents as type nine? I, I confess I'm nervous about doing this because okay. um, several presidents present as type nines. Okay. And I do like to avoid political conversations, but I'm just going to list them all. And <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so President Reagan, um, President Lincoln, mm-hmm. President Ford, and okay. President Obama are four examples that come to mind as leaders who appear to be type nine. And on the more, um, I don't want to say creative side, but I just said it, or, you know, in the entertainment industry, Walt Disney presents okay. type nine. So that the other thing about type nines is they tend to, you know, be very positive, upbeat, rose-colored glasses. And what's, you know, very 
happy. And what's a happier place than Disney? I mean, I haven't right. been myself, but it's what I hear. So. <laughs> can we talk a little bit about strategies that Type 9s can use to help develop their leadership qualities? Sure. I mean, I, I think it tags back to a bit about what I've said around expressing the anger. First of all, recognizing it, because mm -hmm. it's often so deeply suppressed that they're not even aware that they're angry. Um, my closest friend is a type nine, and when she first started looking and working with the Enneagram, she thought, I'm anger. I'm not angry. I'm not suppressing anger. She's pretty angry. <laughs> so, you know, once you start working with it and recognizing it in yourself and then trusting that people can handle that from you, it may require practice with a, like a trusted friend or a trusted business associate where you just say, look, I'm, I'm, this is a new muscle I'm flexing. It's going to be as awkward as the first time I tried a leg exercise at the gym. Can I, you know, have this conversation with you and, and work with someone who can hold that and hear that without it damaging the relationship. And then it becomes something that the type nine is more comfortable with. I will say I've, I, in my business life in my personal life, I have several type nines that I've seen really get in touch with their anger and I love it. Mm. Really I think beginning. we're all thinking about people we know that might be a, a type nine right now based yeah. on what you've shared with us today. What, what tends to happen I find with the type nine is Mary Beth has said and, and they get less at their best and they, they start to lose their awareness, they can kind of disappear. They, they become almost invisible. Like they don't, they are so not wanting to disturb the peace that they disappear themselves. And when they get more in touch and stay with you in a conversation or in, present in the situation, you'll see more of their spark show. Mm -hmm. They get more interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. It's actually more, and they can be quite funny and very engaging. So you just, you want to, you want to actually get to know them more and they don't, they'd stop disappearing and you get curious. So they're very engaging. I think that's reflected in the list of presidents that uh, yeah. Mary Beth mentioned, like they were all very well liked and uh, engaging leaders. Yeah. I know that uh, the whole world looked forward to Obama doing the press dinner every, every year because he would get up and do a bit of stand up and exactly you know, quite, a, quite a good sense Funny. of humor. Yeah, Ronald Reagan, they were, they're quite humorous. And they also are big picture people. Like they're very holistic in their purview. Yeah. I just want to add about Obama too, that there was so much um, conversation in the Enneagram community about what people thought Obama's Enneagram type is or was. I heard everything from nine, one, three, five, so it's, you know, and this is why we don't generally talk about um, people's type, because what we see from the outside is not necessarily what's going on in the inside. Mm. And what, what distinguishes one type from another is are the driving motivations for their strategies, their coping strategies, which is what we experience on the outside. But none of us know what's going on on the inside. That's right. That's right. Except inside of us, and even that takes work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, this brings us to the Enneagram Ones, the reformers, sometimes called perfectionists. I think many of us might have someone like this in their lives. Mm. Can you explain to us who these leaders are and how are they when they are bosses? Yes, the type one, the reformer, sometimes known as the perfectionist. Um, so... You know, the, the deepest fear of somebody who is a dominant type one is of being somehow flawed and, or, 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 you know, not good. Most type ones will present as very good, decent people. Like that is, they're, they're, they're about the good, the common good often as well. They can be quite idealistic. And yet I've never met one who didn't tell me that on the inside they do not feel good. There's always something that they see isn't right, isn't perfect. You know, there's always a gap that they're living with. So you can imagine if that's what's going on on the inside, all you ever see when you look around at the world is what isn't quite right, mm. what needs to be reformed. And yes. because I'm a good person, I am going to absolutely take responsibility for everything I can do 
and provide in order to put things to right. So you get this sense of, um, you know, real authentic care and concern for what could be, for the ideal, for what's best. And um, there's a nobility. I mean, most type ones, you'll notice there's kind of this nobility, even of their carriage and their posture. There's, they're, they, they're willing to be unpopular for what they know is fair and just. So, um, you know, the assets here are there. There's high integrity with the type one. There's a certain, I call it a cleanness. There's a purity in their, their way of operating. They're refined. They tend to have a lot of refinement and great discernment. They have quite an, a capacity for discerning things. Um, what they're like as a boss, as a leader, or somebody to work with or live with, because of that discernment and that fine attention to detail and to seeing what could be, they can sometimes come off as critical, mm. judgmental, even perhaps nitpicky, oh, yes. and a little compulsive about what still needs to be done. So they can become quite serious, like they can never rest. You can imagine, I mean, what uh, if I really were to look at life through the lens of what's not quite right yet, there's a lot of work to do in the world. Yes. And the growth, the developmental work, all of their lives for a type one is to soften, is to get some distance from that inner, just ceaseless, unending criticism about what needs to be perfected and to start to lighten up a little bit, to... Mm -hmm actually start seeing the perfection in the imperfect sounds complicated yeah they are kind of a complicated type and mm -hmm. you, you know you see um, such great nobility and such willingness to give of themselves on behalf of the greater well, good and you'll see a lot of um, people drawn to politics um, who are type ones who want to reform is one of the other names for the type one is the reformer mm. they want to reform the world. They want to make change in the world. It, you know, Hillary Clinton, whether she is or she's not, we don't know, but she presents as type one and she really wanted to take on healthcare reform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. And people kind of see type ones as a little boring, you know, not very, not super charismatic necessarily. Um, and, you know, Hillary, you know, everybody here says so she's not likable. Well, she wasn't trying to be liked. She was trying to do the right thing. She was trying to make change in the world. She had a, she's very mission-driven. Type 1s are super yes. mission-driven. Mm -hmm. um, so they're drawn to politics. They're drawn to being uh, police, police chiefs, the FBI. I wouldn't doubt that James Comey, you know, he presents as mm -hmm. a type 1. He's going to do the unpopular thing, that what he perceives is the right thing. Mm. Yeah, people like it or not. Um, so, so they're drawn to kind of these enforcement or reform or, you know, big, big, big change jobs. Yeah. As well as, you know, um, compliance, regulatory uh, jobs as well. Wow. They tend to be very detail oriented and very high performers. They will suffer uh, quantity for quality. It's about quality. In, in addition to what we're saying, it, you know, type ones have a strong um, predisposition to put structure and process to get around things. Yeah. So when we come through this COVID crisis, I would look to type right. one for the people who will have some great ideas around how to change and put new structure to replace what was the old structures that have fallen apart yeah. um, they're just great at that i mean just gifted at that yeah that sounds to me like we all need some type ones in our lives oh, oh yes, yes. <laughs> yeah well thanks to heather and wendy and mary beth for joining us today on the podcast and also thanks to all you listeners please look at the show notes because i've put some links in there that you'll find useful and please subscribe to our show and tell your friends about it, please. 
To that end, we'd really love it if you'd rate us on iTunes or iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts, because those ratings really will help other people find our podcast. So thanks once again for joining us. This is the Being Human is Good for Business podcast.